Welcome to another video in the Let's Learn Food Science series and today we're going to be talking about project management in food manufacturing and this is accompanying a course that I'm teaching in Niagara College's Culinary Innovation and Food Technology program and in this case it is our fall 2020 course on um, product and process engineering and Project management is going to be a really essential skill set here because so many of the things that we do as food scientists, we're actually not just food scientists, we are also project managers. We are overseeing the implementation of new ideas, new systems, new um, products, new processes, and we need to think systematically about how to effectively implement these new ideas within our organizations. So today's video is going to be part one. There's going to be a few videos coming along in this series. But we're going to talk about why is project management useful. And, and at, at the end of this video, you will be able to discuss why food scientists should study project management, define what a project is and its core attributes, define typical constraints impacting projects, describe the phases of typical projects, list the PM bark or the um, project management body of knowledge, overarching topics of study. We'll define Scrum and Agile project management and understand the process to become a certified project management professional. So project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques applied to project activities in order to meet project requirements. Really think about what a project manager is. They're thinking about projects and they are the ones who are making sure that project gets started, runs smoothly, and gets completed on time in a cost-effective manner. So they're going through planning a project plan, they're putting it into action, and they're measuring pro progress and performance. So, so many of the different things that you are doing as food scientists are related to project management. You've got to think about planning, you've got to enact that plan, and then you've got to measure progress and performance to deliver a new product or a new process. So, what domains specifically in food science use project management? Well, new product development, as you know, uh, many of the students who are with me in this semester are very eager to become new product developers. And new product development is project management. It is all about seeing a new idea, thinking through planning the process of getting that new idea out, enacting that plan, and then having a deliverable, which is cost effective, on time, and meets the needs of the partner that's requesting it. It could also be related to food safety. So perhaps you're implementing a new GFSI program. Maybe your company has always used generic HACCP and now it's deciding that it wants to implement BRC. That implementation of a new system is a project management project, <laughs> a project management project. That's a good way to put it. Um, many, many other times, uh, Food companies are developing new facilities or new processing lines, and that is project management. You could be implementing new traceability systems or new ERP systems. Maybe you have to implement blockchain or SAP as part of uh, getting into new um, vendor requirements. We also will talk about DMAIC. DMAIC, um, there will be some more slideshows and uh, videos coming along, but DMAIC is part of the Six Sigma process, and it's a means of looking at continuous improvement and reducing waste and reducing inefficiency within processes. So all of these are different types of projects that food scientists are routinely engaged in, and it's a good justification why food scientists should be out there actively learning and pursuing skills development in project management. So let's jump backwards. Um, I am working with a textbook and the BC Open Textbook Project has a textbook on project management and I want to uh, give acknowledgement to them for um, inspiring some of the content for this slideshow. But uh, that Open Textbook Project with the uh, Government of British Columbia has been really great in terms of open source uh, texts 
this textbook is available online and I believe I'll put the link in my YouTube video. So what defines a project? Well, projects are unique. They are not the same as operations. So a project has a start and a finish point. And if you think about a food manufacturing establishment, the routine making of food products, the routine operations, the routine implementation of food safety is not a project. That is operations. It's when you have something that's new and something that's distinct from that day-to-day -day routine. It could, it could become, at a later point, part of the day-to-day -day routine, but in the beginning, it is a new concept and a new system that needs to be implemented. And that's one of the key things that defines that project. Projects have clear and agreed upon goals, objectives, outcomes, and deliverables. And that is important that so many times I've worked with different teams and one person will go off and do a, a bunch of stuff, but the rest of the group has not been appraised of what's going on. And in many cases, that individual who's gone off to do interesting things will have their work shut down because it's not clear or agreed upon. So this is where having a system of um, a sequence of events that occurs within a project can be important. If that individual who went about and came up with some great ideas went through some sort of stage gating and approval process, and we'll talk about that in a later slide here, um, they would have clarity and they would have agreed upon goals so that they knew what the outcomes and deliverables would be in that project. Um, last but not least, projects are completed when those goals are achieved or when the project is no longer determined to be viable. And in many projects, there is what's called a stage gating process where you go through different checks and balances as you're going along to say, are we progressing? Are we, are we meeting the targets that we're after? And usually whoever's in that senior management or director's role will go along and say, yep, things are going well. We're really glad to see progress on this project. But there are times when projects need to stop. For example, with the global pandemic that's been occurring um, this past summer, many of the projects that I've been helping coach on, many of those projects, because of changes in market conditions, changes in human resources, changes in um, market dynamics and consumer dynamics, many of the projects that were initiated back in the winter before the global pandemic started were changed drastically, or in some cases, determined to be no longer viable. And you have to be aware as a project manager that in some cases it's okay to say, you know what, we put in a big effort, but we need to step back and just stop what we're doing. It's okay to do that. More often, it's nice to be able to accomplish the goal and just say, yay, we did it. Congratulations. Pat everyone on the back. But in many cases, projects do get stopped in one of these stage gating processes along the way. There are constraints that define projects. And so you can think about uh, cost as being the most, um, the, the biggest impact on projects. Everything that you do costs money and it's very easy to go out and say, oh, well, this will be easy. It won't be too expensive. And then all sorts of different incremental costs come into play. Costs can kill a project quite easily. Um, scope is another one. Without having really clearly defined outcomes, in many cases, projects will go through what's called scope creep, where perhaps different individuals within that project will say, well, wouldn't it be cool if we added on this? Or wouldn't it be cool if we did, instead of three SKUs, we did six SKUs of product? You can have all sorts of different scope creep within projects that can constrain or even kill a project because of it. Another one is quality. Now, as food scientists, we think of quality in a few different ways, but if you undermine cost too much, and you, 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 if, if I use the term nickel and dime on costs, sometimes you end up with a subpar product. So I've seen projects where people will go and say, we want all natural, we want clean label, we want um, highly delicious product. But then as you go through more of the research and understand what's involved, you might realize that you may need to be including preservatives or some sort of processing technology to be able to achieve shelf life or um, the 
capable uh, the capability of storing it under the conditions that your retailer wants. So it's really important to define exactly what the quality expectations are, but within the early implementation phase to be able to have the knowledge and wisdom to say what's feasible and not feasible. Another constraint is risk, and uh, this could be a whole domain of study, and we will have some additional slideshows later on risk management within projects. But um, within any project, there are often unknown variables that are difficult to quantify on the front end. And so, for example, in product development, you could develop the most delicious product ever, but if consumers don't want to buy it, then that's the biggest risk out there. You could have a really great product and you could get it listed on the, in the store shelves, but if that product is delisted in quick succession because something else that was even more innovative came out, that's another risk and it's extremely difficult to quantify. In other things like uh, food safety management and so on, well, those may seem like really clear risks, What's, what's great is there's some really foundational science that can back you up on understanding how to manage and mitigate those risks. When we, when we talk about resources, in many cases we're talking about equipment or facilities or um, in some cases uh, human resources are also a critical factor. I've worked on a variety of different projects where people come and say, oh man, I would really like to make this food product and isn't this the coolest food product ever? But if there's no co-packer out there who's capable of managing this, it goes back to that risk factor. Do they have the, and the cost factor too. There's, the resources aren't there and they don't have the finances to be able to go and start their own facility and purchase in the equipment to be able to do the product. And that resource factor is one of the biggest limitations that we see in, um, in food science because access to some of the high-tech equipment that is necessary to be able to do some of the best projects is extremely costly. And many of the innovators who want to be uh, pushing boundaries don't have those resources available to them. Last but not least, the biggest resource that we have or don't have is time. And in many cases, um, People who want projects done will come in and they say, we want it done yesterday. And it sounds like a bit of a joke, but there, there's truth behind it. Everything takes time and being able to estimate how much time is necessary to do each task is a really critical skill set. We will have some more um, slideshows coming along about doing project scheduling and developing Gantt charts and PERT charts for different projects so that you can have a critical path or a critical chain on the different um, tasks that are necessary to accomplish a project. So who manages projects? They're typical, uh, they are typically leaders. They are leaders of a team and team is in there with intent. Most projects have not just a single person. In many cases, there's an internal team of people who are all employed within the same group. They may be contractors if it's a project with a time limiting aspect, or they may be employees assigned to work on a project within a larger internal group. In other cases, this person's a team leader because they are leading external people. So they may be needing to leverage against suppliers and their knowledge base, um, different subcontractors, different equipment vendors, different um, specialists who could be called in to do uh, subconsulting on a project. And so this person needs to have some really good interpersonal skills. Usually the leader of this team has a strong um, background, whether that's academic or um, through job experience within the area. And so food science, usually this is going to be someone who has some really foundational experience in food science, food product development or food safety. Um, that said, leaders of teams often aren't always the expert in the room. Oftentimes they are the leader who is going to negotiate with those experts and help those experts um, collaborate and get the best uh, information out to serve the project. Usually the leader has really good background in standards and regulations and industry norms. And so usually it's not someone fresh out of school who is a project leader. That said, that said ironically, We've seen lots of graduates from the Niagara College program go out because food scientists 
with project management leadership skills are very rare fresh out of school. And so oftentimes they'll go and join small startup companies because of their uh, really polyvalent skill set, and they will immediately start leading projects. And then they'll leverage against experts such as our friends over at the Research and Innovation Center, or they'll call up their, their professors and ask all sorts of advice as um, leveraging that expertise. But you'll be dealing with people from all sorts of backgrounds and uh, leading projects can be a lot of fun. Um, I've had the chance to lead some projects internationally and thinking about the cultural dimensions of project leadership and how different experts work together in teams. There's um, a whole field of study and those of you who are following along with the textbook as well, there's a whole section on cultural dynamics in, in the text. So within, within projects, there are different phases. And obviously, first off, there's an initiation phase. This is where you are starting with some scoping and idea or ideation. You're generating ideas and you're doing some feasibility and justification. Those of you who are in the culinary innovation program will see some parallels between um, our innovation class where we do a lot of feasibility justification work with SWATs and um, uh, DFEI matrices and blue ocean mapping. But uh, this is where you're going through and really thinking about what you want to do and defining out in clear um, in a clear way what the outcomes and deliverables are going to be. From there, you're going to build out a team and decide who those core team members are and who some of the consults may be that you need to make your project successful. And then you'll get some stage gate approval to go on to the next phase. Usually that's from some senior manager, possibly the owner of the company, um, but they're the ones who are going to say, okay, your project uh, initial plan is makes sense. We'll release some resources so that you can go on to the next phase. So the next phase is going to be planning. You're going to start really going to some granular level of detail how you're going to get to those objectives. In the initiation phase, you are looking at really high level. What do you want to achieve? But now you're starting to go into the minor details. What are the individual steps and tasks that are needed? What are the resources that are going to be required to do this? Or do you need equipment? Do you need people? Do you need um, cash? What are the labor requirements? You've got to define that all out. From there, you're going to do some schedule setting. And as I mentioned before, we will do some project management scheduling um, in a later slideshow. You've got to continually go about doing feasibility assessment and justification. Sometimes at the higher level, you'll go through and say, yeah, this sounds great. We, everything's in there. But then the moment that you go in and start doing some schedule, you'll, you'll realize, oh, wait a second. The equipment that we, that we knew was available actually is booked up until November. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, you may have made some commitments to say, wait a second, we'll have this project to you by the end of October. This is where that feasibility and justification needs to be continually cycled through. You've got to be able to go back and say, wait a second, here's what we said we were going to deliver and here's what we can actually deliver and go back and justify what's going on. You're also gonna start doing some risk assessment, both uh, financial, food safety, um, feasibility, and so on. You will start also identifying what are your quality control measures. And again, uh, those of you who are in the Culinary Innovation Program, you're taking a quality control program right now, but this is not the same as food quality control. This is where you are setting up checks and balances uh, along the route of this project to say, are we progressing the way we anticipate? And if we are not, progressing the way we anticipate, how can we quickly put in some sort of corrective measure to get back on track? And so it may be saying, have we met these, um, have we met these targets in terms of deliverables? Do we have a prototype ready by the end of September? Do we have um, all of our ingredient suppliers lined up with uh, contract prices um, set? These could be appropriate quality control measures that become those stage gate um, processes, as well as the um, benchmarks to say we're on target for our progress or we need to uh, modify and uh, subordinate resources to a constraint so that we can get back on time. 
and we're in the implementation phase. So that we've got a really great project plan that has been approved and resources released. From there, we're going to go ahead and start enacting that project plan and monitoring the progress of it. We'll communicate with all the different stakeholders and track the different activities that are going on. And if we are noticing and measuring that activities are not on track, we will provide corrective action to keep those activities on track. As I mentioned just a moment ago, that if an activity is falling behind, you may have to um, reallocate resources, uh, in some cases people or money or um, just time to be able to accomplish the goals that are necessary in that section. Then uh, the fun is we get to the closing phase. This is where you're going to hand over your deliverable and hand over any documentation and support to the client. You're going to close off any contracts and release any resources that were necessary for the pur uh, purposes of that project. Oftentimes those resources are people, um, but it could be equipment. It could be, um, usually it's equipment and people that you're in the process of releasing. Um, Big one is evaluating and sharing your experience within your team to make sure that things that were working well are acknowledged and repeated and things that didn't work well are going to be um, given some attention to find corrective op uh, opportunities. So um, moving uh, into the second section of this slideshow, there is what's called the project management body of knowledge and there are a whole lot of different resources available to you on the internet um, and uh, through some of the textbooks that I've provided for the people in the organized class but uh, PM Bach or project management body of knowledge is a very systematic approach to thinking about the skill sets necessary to manage projects so you've got integration this is collective movement of all the different parts of a project um, in the textbook that we're following, they talk about playing whack-a-mole. Uh, that's a carnival game where you, uh, a, little, a little rodent pops his head out of a uh, board and you're supposed to bop the rodent on the head. And you never know where the rodent's going to stick his head out of the game. Um, that's sort of like project management, that there's always going to be a problem sticking out of a different section and you've got to be able to move with a collective system in that, in that project as, as the project manager. You've got to be able to think about scope of a project and break down all the tasks that are necessary to accomplish the project. You've got to be able to manage time and schedule, including understanding how to estimate how long it takes to do a task and then develop that schedule from there. You've got to be able to do cost estimating and budgeting and resource planning. So you've got to be able to make some phone calls and understand the cost of goods, the cost of services, and be able to add it all up into a big package to say, here's what we think this project is actually going to cost. You've got to know what quality means for your project. How can you ensure that deliverable is, is, is being delivered exactly as it's specified? There's a human resources piece. You've got to be able to find the right people with the right skills and build the right corporate or team culture to make your project man uh, uh, manage. Communication is another one where you've got to be able to um, describe what's going on and communicate to all of the different stakeholders about the activities going on. Managing risks. So you've got to be able to identify and analyze it. You've got to be able to respond to it and control it. And so there's a continuum in the risk management piece. There is a piece that goes along with cost and that's procurement. So you've got to be able to negotiate contracts with vendors, contractors, and equipment providers, and be able to go through and do the selection and do the evaluation of all of these different um, service providers. Because again, usually within project management, you are not doing everything yourself. You are negotiating with a variety of different individuals to be able to provide all the different services. Last but not least, all the different stakeholders. You could have investors, you could have uh, students, you could have team members, uh, directors and managers within your company. You've got to be able to go out and show a positive face about the project and manage all the different relationships within it. One, uh, one topic that often comes up when talking about project management, especially in food product development, is the term Scrum or Agile. And the term comes from a rugby scrimmage. If you think about um, many different sports, uh, I don't know if you've 
follow rugby, but you will see a lot of activity in the game. And then all of a sudden they'll stop and they'll meet together as a little team and they'll, they'll stand around in a circle and they'll give instructions to each other and then they'll go and play a game. And it's that repeated small reset in a project that allows for iteration. <laughs> Those of you who take class with me know I, I love walking around the room going, iteration. <laughs> but the idea of iteration is that you are going through and um, rethinking so that you can get the best outcome possible and oftentimes attacking a problem from multiple directions. But if you're attacking it in really small bursts in multiple directions, then you can correct your course, eliminate the directions that are not fruitful, and redirect towards the solutions that are getting you closer to your goal. This works really, really well when you've got a lot of ambiguity in a project. Um, oftentimes we work with different clients who really don't know what they want. They just want something new and iteration allows you to go ahead and figure out what that something new is and get to that goal. It allows you to have that reset and revisit with the different stakeholders so that you can report back and recalibrate what the work plan is going to be. Now, a couple last details as we wrap up this slideshow, but PMI is the largest accreditation body for project managers in North America, and they oversee a certification for project managers uh, called the PMP uh, certification, professional or uh, project management professional, pardon me. And they, uh, PMI provides a training platform and continuing education and standardization for project managers. And it's something worth uh, thinking about as you progress in your career. If project management is something that you really are finding exciting, having a PMP certification can be a benefit to you in your career. So how do you get it? It's uh, If you have a four-year degree, you need to have 36 months or th uh, three calendar years leading projects, along with a minimum of 35 hours of project management education and training, or you could have a high school diploma or an associate's degree um, or a global equivalent. So an associate's degree is typically a three-year post-secondary program, along with uh, 60 months of project leadership and 35 hours of, of education and training. From there, you would study a wide variety of different resources. There are a lot of different training uh, platforms online. You would pay the fee and you would sit the certification exam. And at that point, fingers crossed, you are successful. You would be able to use the uh, PMP designation as part of your uh, career search and part of your employment strategy. So something worth thinking about for the future. Um, those of you who are taking the course along with me at Niagara College, um, you would have the uh, equivalent of an associate's degree, and so you would require 60 months or approximately five years leading projects. It's feasible, it's doable, um, but you think back to an earlier slide that I have in there, you need to have a, uh, accumulated a, lot, a large body of knowledge and wisdom to be able to oversee projects, and that just comes with time on the job. So do not fret. I am optimistic that many of you will have the capability of succeeding as a uh, project management professional. And I already see glimmers of uh, inspiration for many of you in your abilities to manage different projects and uh, whether those are classroom projects or community-based projects. So something we're thinking about. It's, it's, it's a really cool certification and can take you a long way in terms of progressing your career quickly. I think that's the end of my slideshow. That is. So you know where to find me if you have questions. Take care and we will talk to you again soon.